Good morning, everybody. Hope you're well this morning. Whoo! It is... Which, oh, look at this. So that little squiggly line there was one of my grandchildren doing their quiet time. About two years old. Taking notes in the Bible. Making sure they mark their spots. We have had a return visit to the person of Jesus. Right? And the... Uh, his incredible way of being as both God and man. And, uh, you know, in John 1, it speaks just this beautiful little thought or truth, right, that, um, there we go, of the fact that God would become man, that he would cloak himself in our flesh, that he would walk among us. That he would unveil the Father. That the creator and maker of all things, the one who holds all things together, is the great provider in his incredible enormity would know each one of us, would know us, humanity and every one of us by name than each of us who would come and that paradox or that contrast I think an astounding thought and so to watch Jesus walk on earth and to listen for his voice and to you know uh, together in his wisdom um we ought not underestimate the privilege, but also the astonishing and um, humbling thought that here he is with us because he loves us, because his father loves us enough to send his only begotten son who would leave his glory, walk among us, not use his power to his own advantage and remain steadfast and true and merciful and loving even in the midst of rejection confusion obstinance he remains it's a pretty stellar pretty stellar thought if you ask me so where we are is there's a there's a particular phrase that i think is really important um, that I don't want to breeze over. When he's having this discourse with his disciples with regard to who the people believe that he is. Of course, we've been through that and we talk, he talks about, you know, that some people think that one of the prophets has come back to life or come and returned. And Jesus would later say, yes, when prophet came, the spirit of Elijah was here. It was John the Baptist as a forerunner to the Messiah. And then... Then he begins, he, he warns them. He says, listen, don't tell anyone that what you know. They're not going to understand it. They can't receive it. You don't fully understand it. Allow the miracles and the countenance and the teaching and the, um, the kingdom moving forward to do the work on the hearts of the people. Let's not feed into their confusion. Let's not feed into the idea of what they believe the Messiah is. Let it unveil before them. So he warns them not to say anything. And then he reminds them, listen, the, this Messiah will not be what everyone thinks. And in fact, this victorious king that they're expecting, they're going to watch suffer and die on a cross. And it's going to be utterly confusing for them. They are not going to understand it. Um, and if you try to just work it out intellectually, you'll come to naught, he says. This is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the conversion of the soul. That is the Holy Spirit speaking to the hearts of men as, and women as to unveil this truth. Then he speaks to what it, it's actually going to take to be a follower of this Messiah. It is not that he's going to rally all the troops and the army and he's going to overthrow Rome and going to be seated on a throne and we'll have a scepter of both justice and peace and we'll rule 
and make Israel this triumphant nation again. It's the exact opposite. So again, we made a comparison before, you know, on Palm Sunday, he comes in on a bull of a donkey called the Prince of Peace, saying, declaring peace. That's what the donkey represented. He didn't come on, come in on a horse, looking to conquer, looking to overthrow, looking to gather the troops to have a coup or revolution. No, it was much different than that. And so the idea of following the Messiah had been, he'll gather us up, he'll return us to our glory, we'll have victory, we'll be a prominent uh, nation on the scope, on the landscape of the world. Again, honored and respected, feared. That's what they were looking forward to. And so to follow that king, frankly, makes sense to the human being. He whips up a vision, he gathers the people, he puts the mission forward, he, he, he works them up into a lather, and they go about the business. And they're all seated on thrones, in essence. He flips that upside down with the next statement. And it's understanding this statement in light of others. So we talk a lot about, for instance, we talk a lot about, you hear the phrase, pick up your cross, carry your cross, and follow me. And in and of itself, that's, that's a dynamic statement. That is a statement of, of uh, humiliation and sacrifice and confusion, especially in the early church, to these disciples who knew what the cross meant, the most painful and humiliating death uh, of not only criminals, but also citizens as an example who may not have, frankly, done anything wrong or anything worthy of that type of sentence, and yet they would do it anyway to prove a point. It was brutal. And so when Jesus speaks of carrying the cross, he's speaking of, you know, on one hand you could say, we're going to revolt against the cross and the country that wields the cross. But that's not how Jesus puts it. So the cross could have been a symbol of Rome and their conquering and their brutality and their, uh, their cruelty. And we could use the cross as an emblem of our revolt, that we're going to defeat that. Mm. Jesus says something very interesting here. Look what it says. This is Luke 9.23. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And pray, Lord God, we would learn what it is to, one, pick up our cross, but maybe more profoundly tonight to deny oneself and what that looks like in real time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus then said to them all, after he asked the question, who do they say that I am? He hears about the prophets. Peter answered, you're the Christ, the Messiah. He then says, don't tell anyone this truth. You need to understand something you don't understand. This Messiah the one who's actually come to bring peace and to unveil the heart of the Father, must suffer many things, including death. And then he goes right into what would be completely contrary to their original thoughts. He says, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would follow me, if anyone would be a part of me, if anyone would learn from me, if anyone wants to be part of this kingdom movement that is actually what it will be, as opposed to what it is you imagine it being, this is what you have to do. The first command is, you must deny yourself. Well, on one hand, that still makes sense if it's a revolution, right? I'm going to give my life for the sake of freedom and a revolt and conquering so that the generations to come will be free. You go, mm, okay, that makes sense. But what's he actually talking about here? Or the, the, well, the word here means to put down one's own interests. Why is that important in this context? Because their interest was to allow Israel to become the dominant nation in the, in the region again, to overthrow Rome, to become the conquering nation that it once was, the pinnacle nation of power and trepidation for others that it had become. Not the light to the Gentiles that it was supposed to be, nor the light to the Gentiles that the Messiah had come to be, but in fact a conquering group better than, above, ruling over. So what is he saying here? You must deny yourself. And the, the thing here then is you must 
put down your own interests, the things that you are committed to, that you're desirous of, the things that you are aiming for or, or working toward. You need to put that down. In order for you to follow me, you must follow me with a whole heart, with a full devotion, a recognition of what it is, who I am, and what I've come to do, how I've come to do it, and then join me in the doing and how I do it. You must deny yourself. Philippians puts it this way, and it's not quite as emphatic, but let me read it real quick. Philippians chapter 2. Go eat popcorn. Just let me read this to you very quickly in regard to interests, putting down our interests. Listen to what it says. And this is speaking to the church now, those who have been gathered up, those who do know the Messiah as he is, those who still, right, or who are who are who have picked up their cross to follow him, but there's still this kind of fleshly uh, propensity to be more interested in your own interests than the interests of others or the interests of the king. The interest of the king is that we would have an eternal perspective working toward the kingdom, um, worshiping the Lord God who deserves worship because he is our maker and creator. He's our life giver and provider. He's our sustainer and our keeper. He is glorious and holy, perfect. And his mercy expressed to us by not wiping us out when we were standing in opposition to him, but in fact letting us live and then drawing us to himself and then giving us life through grace, the death of his own son in our hands. He says, no, no, follow me. So in Philippians 2, when we talk about interest, this idea of denying oneself, this is not merely to pick up the cross to follow Jesus for the first time and recognize who our king actually is and what it is, what it is he's achieving in the kingdom that he's bringing forward in the eternal life that we have been promised and in which we place our hope and then desire for others to have the same hope. And so we are about the same business Jesus is. But even after we're saved, we struggle with our flesh. We struggle with our own desires. We struggle with our own interests. And we, we must recognize that the taking up of the cross is not merely taking it and following him for the first time for salvation, laying down my life, allowing me to die to self, to be devoted to Christ. It is a daily endeavor for the rest of my life with regard to slaying my flesh. If I go to Galatians 5, it says, the flesh wants what's contrary to the spirit, which is the spirit of the kingdom of heaven, the spirit of Christ himself, the one to, to whom we carry our cross and follow, right? The flesh wants what's contrary to the spirit, and the spirit wants, what, wants what's contrary to the flesh. In other words, our interests are different than kingdom interests if we, if we adhere to the desires of our heart or flesh, the temptations of this world and what it is it brings, and what it is we believe it will give us. He's saying, no, no, no. So he says this in Philippians 2. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, this idea that you have recognized who he is, you've received from him the right to become a child of God, you have been inserted into the kingdom of heaven, you have taken up your cross, you have died to self, died to sin, died to the law, and now follow Jesus, the, who is the, the conquering hero of my heart by his mercy, grace, and love. If I've been united to Christ, if I have any comfort from that love that I've received from him, that I can rest in the truth of my father having crafted me and knows my name and gathered me up and saved me, and now I'm a dearly beloved child, destined for eternal life by faith, something given to me by grace. If I have any fellowship with the Spirit, the God that resides in me, and empowers me, and enlightens me, reminds me of everything Jesus is, con con continues to conform me into the likeness of Christ, bears the fruit of the Spirit. If, any, if I've experienced any tenderness and compassion, this God of compassion, this, or uh, this Father of compassion, God of all comfort, who comforts me in my trouble, who meets me and becomes my refuge and my healer. Hmm. Then Paul goes on to say, then make my joy complete. Here it is, by being like-minded. All of us moving with the same mindset, moving toward the kingdom, seeing our God and King for who he actually is and who we are to him and who we are among one another. So it says, be like-minded, having the same love, sincere, deep, rich. Having been loved, we now love. Being one in spirit and purpose, that means mission and goal. That spirit is not capital S spirit, Holy Spirit. He mentioned this before. This is the spirit of us moving forward together, uh, uh, an esprit, 
right? A, a, com a, a comradeship, a movement in the same direction with the same attitude. So to be like-minded, having the same, uh, excuse me, being, uh, being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Look at what it says now. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Mm. Do nothing that is the, uh, uh, the fruit of your flesh's and heart's desire with regard to the world or self. You, what, what, is, what would interest you most in lieu of the people around you or the king you follow? Something that would cause you to be immodest in making yourself the center of attention or the highest, being haughty and arrogant. Listen, he says, do not do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Things that come to naught. Jesus would later say, so what good is it for you to gain the whole world if you lose your soul? What good is it for you to, to gain all these accolades or this power or prestige or position or prosperity and yet not be generous toward God and others? Doing this all for self. Look at what it says now. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but... Here it is. In humility, consider others as better than yourself. Lift them up. See them for who they are in regard to value and significance because not only have they been made in the image of God, but not, they are also dearly loved children. So in humility, consider others as better than yourself. This doesn't mean self-destruction or self-deprecation. Um, it means humility in a sober view and the, the desire to edify and to lift. Now listen to this. Each of you should look not only to your own interests. Now what does he mean by that? We're called to be responsible, to be good stewards. We recognize that we have responsibilities to take care of, and we carry a weight of responsibility for that which we've been given. So there is a degree of interest that is necessary for good life, to be... Uh, to be uh, responsible and accountable and to care for those around us, to take care of self. So there is something to be said, but listen to what he goes on to say. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So there's the denial, right? I am to take care. I need to wash my body. I need to clothe it. I need to feed it. I need to take care of, I need to love my wife and my children and take care of them and, and that which I've been given. I need to be a good steward of all that I have that I might be able to be generous with others. That my interests are taken care of by my great provider. What did he say? He said, listen, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, your body, what you'll wear. He goes on to say, your father knows you need all this. You seek the kingdom of heaven. You take up your cross, follow me. You deny yourself and those selfish ambition, vain conceit interests. And you walk with me. You follow me. And I will convert your heart. And you will begin to see your stuff, your position, your prestige, even your own person with a sober view, a right view, a correct view, even a loving view, humbly. And then you'll be able to open your eyes to see the interests of others. You'll be able to not deny yourself for the sake of another. You'll, need, you'll be able to lower yourself to raise others up and not be self-deprecating or be afraid of somehow being trampled over, but instead realizing your value, your worth, and your position in Christ, that you are now able to rest in that, be secure in that, knowing that you're loved and edify others. So each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Therefore, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus, who, though he was God, didn't hold on to that, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. What did he do? He denied himself. He denied himself, and he went about his Father's will. Jesus would later say in another gospel, he says, Listen, my Father loves me because I obey him. And I remain in his love because I continue to obey him. And it's not a slave-master relationship in regard to obedience. It is a loving relationship in regard to wanting to please. That's the transformation and the conversion of the heart of the believer that we now reflect Jesus. The one who has my commands and does them, he's the one who loves me. The evidence of his love is that he trusts me. He desires to please me. And we please one another. Look what it says. So he says now back in Luke 9, and we'll close it here. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. And then he must take up his cross, how often? Daily. 
and follow me. Denial. Self-denial. It is the matter of our heart's desires, affections, and our interests in light of the interests of the King and the Messiah who has come to save, has gathered, up, gathered, gathered us up to himself because we've been willing to go, oh, I can't do this on my own. Oh, seeking the kingdom far outweighs and outshines anything else that I could seek. And oh, my Heavenly Father has promised that in the seeking of the kingdom, I will receive everything I need. And now my interests are taken care of by my father. I steward them out of respect and appreciation. And I hold them loosely that I might now look to the interests of others. I might edify them. I might lift them up. I may see them as better than myself. Lovingly, joyfully, humbly, with an air toward service. What is it to not I myself today? It is to not have selfish ambition, to avoid vain conceit, to do things to draw attention to myself, but in fact to humbly serve my God and walk with him, love him and realize and appreciate all that he's done for me, is doing in me and will do through me, and what he's promised to do in the future. And then be present with the people I'm with and look to their interests. How might I help them carry their burden? How might I rejoice with them when they rejoice and mourn with them when they mourn? How might I be interested in bringing the character and the nature of the kingdom forward instead of my own ideas, my own whims, my own desires? Deny oneself. Daily pick up the cross and follow Jesus. He's our aim. It's in his footsteps we walk. It is, it is on his coattail. Hmm. Today. Denying self.